Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here. This time, let's talk about exposure compensation. In this video, we're going to take the confusion out of exposure compensation, from what it does to what it adjusts, to knowing when to use it, and so much more. Let's go. What exposure compensation does. First, I think we should talk about what exposure compensation actually does. Exposure compensation is used to override your camera's exposure decision when you're shooting in an auto exposure mode. That's really it. Still, the big question is, why do we need it at all? The reason is simple, our meters aren't perfect. While most of the time they do get the exposure calculation correct for our images, there are times the system either under or overexposes. The problem is, in an auto exposure mode, we need a way to correct the camera when it makes a mistake like that, and that's where exposure compensation comes in. For example, let's say you're shooting an aperture priority and for the scene you're photographing, the camera is underexposing, maybe all the images are a little too dark. Often, people will try to increase ISO or open up the lens more to let in more light. However, since aperture priority is in auto exposure mode, the camera will simply adjust the shutter speed to compensate for the increase in ISO or the larger f-stop, whichever you chose, and you'll still get the exact same underexposure because the camera is going to keep making the same metering mistake it did the first time. That's where exposure compensation comes in. Let's say with our underexposed example, the camera is underexposing by one stop. In this case, we simply add one stop of positive exposure compensation to correct the error. This is typically done by pressing a little button that looks like what you see here and turning a dial. Now when we shoot, the camera will add an additional stop of light to its exposure calculation, in this case resulting in a proper exposure. And by the way, always remember to turn exposure compensation back to zero once you don't need it anymore. Of course, you can also use exposure compensation as a creative control if you want to maybe deliberately make an image lighter or darker than normal. What exposure compensation adjusts? So what happens when you use exposure compensation? This actually seems to be a mystery to a lot of photographers. In fact, I've had more than a few conversations where the person seemed to think exposure compensation came from somewhere other than ISO, aperture, or shutter speed. And that is never the case. Exposure compensation has to come from one of the three main exposure controls. As far as what's actually adjusted, exposure compensation adjusts the setting or settings that the camera is adjusting in your current auto exposure mode. A key point to remember is that exposure compensation can only adjust what the camera can adjust. It can never change the exposure controls that you set in a given auto exposure mode. Now, there's a side note for auto ISO. Auto ISO allows the camera to add ISO to what it can adjust for compensation. While I can't speak for every camera, most will first try to take compensation from the primary exposure control they are allowed to adjust, aperture or shutter speed or both depending on the mode. If that's not enough, the camera will turn to ISO. Now, when would this happen? One example is if the exposure compensation you dial in would require the camera to drop the shutter speed below the minimum shutter speed you have set in the auto ISO menu when you're in aperture priority or program. At that point, it's going to turn to ISO for compensation. For shutter priority, it'll turn to ISO if the lens is wide open and it still needs more brightness to apply the compensation that you set. As a side note, if the camera's already dipping into auto ISO and you use exposure compensation, it's a good bet that your compensation will come from ISO. In the next section, we're going to look at some tips that'll help you recognize when to use or not use exposure compensation. However, keep in mind that what we can do here in the video is limited. If you're a Nikon shooter and you really want to take the mystery out of exposure and metering, then you got to grab my ebook, Exposure and Metering for Nikon. In the book, we'll cover everything you need to know about exposure and metering in a friendly, easy to understand way that makes technical complexities a breeze to comprehend. Make sure you check it out. Knowing when to use exposure compensation. So how do you know when you're gonna need exposure compensation? The first way is easy. You take a shot and discover that it's either under or overexposed. If it's too bright, dial in negative exposure compensation. If it's too dark, dial in positive compensation. If you happen to have a mirrorless camera, you can usually actually preview the image, often with a histogram, and make these adjustments before you shoot. Now, how much compensation you need depends just how far under or overexposed the scene is. 
I'll put a slide up with some over and underexposed examples to give you an idea. However, the truth is that much of this comes from practice. You'll have to start learning what a stop or two stops over or underexposed looks like when you review your images. For most images though, you won't need a big adjustment. Most of my exposure compensation is one stop or less either side of the zero mark. It's also helpful to learn when you may or may not need exposure compensation just by looking at the scene. To be successful at this, you have to have at least a basic understanding of how your camera's meter thinks. So I'm gonna give you kind of some very brief, very general guidelines that should help get you started. First, you have to realize that our camera meters can't really see what we're seeing. They look at the light reflected from the scene and assume that this light is coming from a subject that reflects an average amount of light, basically middle tone gray, like this little gray card I have right here. Since most scenes fall into this category, this works well. However, where we can get into trouble and need exposure compensation is when we have a scene that's dominated by light or dark tonalities. To give you a stark example of this, check out these three pieces of paper, one white, one black, and one middle tone gray. When I crop in, so all the camera sees is the tonality of a single sheet of paper, watch what the camera does with the exposure. The white looks really underexposed, the black is way overexposed, and the gray, well, you know, that looks correct since that's what the camera is expecting. Now, check this out. If we convert them all to black and white and compare side by side, you'll see that the tonality is the same across the board, middle tone gray. What's happening? Simple. The camera is using the only tool it has, light, to make everything middle tone. Think of it like this. If your only tool was light and you needed to make something white into middle tone gray, how would you do it? Yep, you take light away from that scene. If you had a black piece of paper and you wanted to make it gray using only light, how would you do it? Yep, you'd add light. And that's just what your camera is doing and what we need exposure compensation to correct. So how do we correct for this? Well, now that you know how the meter thinks, it's actually pretty easy. For scenes dominated by light tonalities, like our white sheet of paper, we know the camera's going to underexpose, so we compensate by adding positive exposure compensation so the whites are rendered lighter than middle tone as they should be. For scenes dominated by darker tonalities, like our black sheet of paper, we know the camera's gonna want to overexpose, so we compensate with negative exposure compensation so those dark tonalities are rendered darker than middle tone, again, as it should be. In fact, let's take a look at some real world examples. Okay, so this is the scenario that we're in most of the time, and that's a scenario where we actually don't need exposure compensation. In this particular example right here, this is a great example of this, you can see that everything in here is more or less middle tone or pretty close to it. Some areas are a little darker, some are a little lighter, but for the most part, we're looking at pretty much middle tones throughout the scene. Now, one hint, when you're looking at a particular scene, trying to decide if you want to use exposure compensation or not, is just to picture what it looks like in black and white, and then say, hey, how close is this to a gray card. In this case, it's pretty darn close, so I didn't use any exposure compensation at all. So that's basically the idea here. Let's take a look at another. Okay, so for this image, as you can see, we have a lot of dark tonalities going on here. In fact, if we go to black and white, you can see that the only thing that kind of remotely resembles the tonality of a gray card is just this brighter area on our face here and maybe back here on our back. So the rest of the image is darker than middle tone. The majority of the image is darker than middle tone. So the camera wants to overexpose. It wants to make everything middle tone. And obviously we don't want these areas to be middle tone. We want them to be darker than middle tone because that's what they actually look like. So in this case, it was minus two thirds of a stop of exposure compensation to correct the camera's error when it tried to overexpose. So anytime you run into a situation where you see a lot of these dark tonalities, that's your clue that you probably need to think about negative exposure compensation. Let's talk about this little bird right here. And what happened here was a combination of things. This is actually a minus one for exposure compensation. And you're looking at it thinking, man, I don't know if you'd need minus one, but here's what happened. We had this background over here and it was about middle tone or maybe a little darker than middle tone as far as tonality goes. But the bird itself was in a little bit brighter light than the background, but you can't just look at your subject. You have to look at everything that's going on in the frame. And that's what the camera's metering was doing. It's looking at everything. It's looking at the background. It's looking at the foreground. It's looking at the bird. And had I not done that minus one, this whole area would have been blown out. And the reason for that is it was trying to not just bring the tonalities in the background up to 
middle tone, but it was also looking at the light levels back there, which were actually darker than the light levels over here. So you have to keep all of that kind of stuff in mind. But again, as a general rule, if you're looking at a scene, and you see lots of darkness behind the subject, or there's a lot of dark tonalities behind the subject, or the subject's in brighter light, and there's a lot of background behind it, those are the kind of clues that are going to tell you you're probably going to need some negative exposure compensation. In this case, it was one stop. And ideally, if you have the opportunity, it's just to take a test shot and see. And I did have plenty of time to do that with this patient little fellow here. And finally, I wanted to give you a classic example of when you're definitely going to need positive exposure compensation. In this case, we have a polar bear with snow around her. And as you can see, there's a lot of areas here that are brighter than a gray card, brighter than middle tone. Matter of fact, let's go to black and white here. And you can see almost all of this area behind her is brighter than a gray card. She is slightly brighter than the gray card. Almost everything in here is brighter than a gray card. So the camera definitely wanted to underexposed because it wants to make everything middle tone. So when it sees all that bright light, it says, oh, I need to take light away in order to make this middle tone. And we don't want that. Instead, we want it to render as we see it, which is brighter than middle tone. In this case, the camera missed it by a whole stop. So I added a full stop of exposure compensation in the field to make sure that my whites and my brighter tonalities rendered as they should be and not as middle tone gray. Now there's another situation that's pretty common for wildlife photographers, and that is if we're photographing a white animal, maybe a bird or a mammal, whatever you have, up against a middle tone or darker background, and that animal has some sunlight on it. You can often have problems with the highlight areas in those circumstances, and you want to dial down exposure compensation a little bit. Okay, so here's a really good example of what I was talking about. We have a white bird and a background that's middle tone to darker in tonality, and this is where it's very easy to get clipping, especially along these brighter areas, right where the sun's hitting the hardest, right there on the bird, right in here, and right along these wing edges. Those are classic areas, and along the backs of necks here, those are classic areas to get clipping in a situation like this if you don't compensate. So for this one, I did a negative two-thirds of a stop worth of compensation, and I realize what you're thinking. You're looking at it saying, wait a minute, that's a white bird. You just told me white things I should be adding exposure, not taking it away, but you have to look at the overall image. And keep in mind, this is an eight by 10 crop, so there's more of this vegetation than what you see here. But even with the eight by 10 crop, the bird's only taking up maybe 15, 20% of it. At least the white part of the bird is only taking up 15 to 20% of the frame. And those really bright areas are taking up, you know, just a few percentage points. And those are the ones that we're trying to protect. I would much rather have to bring my exposure up in Lightroom a little bit. And by the way, that's a good reason to shoot raw, but I would much rather have to bring my exposure up in Lightroom a little bit and make sure that I'm not clipping any of these really bright areas than to allow those areas to clip and not be able to bring them back down. So that's why in a situation just like this, where you have a white bird or a white animal against a background that's middle tone or darker, that's why we go ahead and dial in that little bit of negative compensation just to protect those highlight areas. However, that's not to say you should do it every time. In this shot, we have this great egret. He's running with a little fish in his mouth. And this was actually a plus one. And the reason for that is simple. Most everything in this frame is brighter than middle tone. The only thing that's middle tone to me, it looks like right along this edge here, and not even this entire area, just this small little section right here is middle tone. Everything else in here is pretty much brighter than middle tone. So in that case, the camera is going to want to underexpose because the background's not going to fool it. It's going to see all this big white bird. It's going to see all this sky. It's going to see all this other area here, and it's going to try to underexpose the image. So in this case, plus one did make sense because everything's brighter than middle tone. So hopefully that will help you when you're out there photographing those white animals. When exposure compensation doesn't work. One of the most common complaints with exposure compensation is that sometimes the camera is either under or overexposing and the exposure compensation setting doesn't seem to do anything. The reason is simple. You've hit an exposure cap of some form. We don't typically see a problem in aperture priority since there are a wide range of shutter speeds to choose from or in program since the camera can use both shutter speed and f-stops for compensation. However, in shutter priority, the camera can run out of f-stops it can open or close, and in manual with auto ISO, it can run out of available ISO, usually because the max ISO is set too low and it doesn't have enough range. Let's look at an example with manual plus auto ISO, since I know a lot of the wildlife photographers 
that follow this channel tend to use that setup. Remember, in this case, you set the shutter speed and the f-stop and the camera floats the ISO for a proper brightness level. Further, let's say your shutter speed is set to 1 1,000th of a second and your f-stop is set to f8. We'll also say that in this scenario, you need ISO 6400 in order to get a proper level of brightness for the scene in question. However, you have your maximum ISO set to ISO 1600. That means when you take the shot, you see a two stop under exposure. What do you do? Then you try to add two stops of exposure compensation to fix it. And guess what? Nothing happens. The reason? Simple. You told the camera it can't go past ISO 1600, and that's the only control the camera is allowed to adjust. In this case, remember, you're setting the shutter speed and f-stop. The camera, in this case, actually can't even get enough ISO to get the exposure it wants to use, much less add anything for compensation. In fact, often when this happens, you don't even need any compensation at all. You just happen to hit the ISO cap and ended up with an underexposure. So what's the solution here? Well, if you're capped out, you actually still have choices. We can increase our maximum ISO sensitivity to 6400, or we can drop our shutter speed to 1 250th of a second, or we can open the lens to F4 or some combination of all of that. Any of that is gonna get the camera to where it wants to be for its calculated exposure. However, now if it turns out that positive exposure compensation is still required, we need to gain more than just two stops. Otherwise, we'll be right back to an underexposure problem where our exposure compensation is capped out. We may be where the camera wants, but if we still need compensation, we have to pull it from someplace. And again, we're hitting our caps here. So the option here is to maybe increase our maximum ISO to 3200. We could drop our f-stop to 5.6, and maybe we knock our shutter speed down to 1 500th of a second. And obviously, there's a lot of combinations you can do here, but in the end, that gives us three stops, so we get the extra two stops we need for the camera, and then we have up to one stop to use for positive exposure compensation. By the way, the same thing happens in shutter priority, only the cap we run into is f-stops, usually the maximum f-stop. Using auto ISO with shutter priority can help since it gives the camera another setting to adjust though. At any rate, the key here to remember is that with exposure compensation, the camera can only adjust the setting or settings it's responsible for and nothing else. If exposure compensation doesn't seem to be working, check to see if the settings the camera controls are capped out. Exposure compensation versus manual exposure. So if the camera is making a mistake in auto exposure, why not just go to full manual mode, right? Well, you totally can. However, there is a serious advantage to using exposure compensation instead of full manual in some instances. If you have a situation where the light levels are changing, but the tonality of the scene is fairly consistent, that's where exposure compensation can really shine. The thing is, if the camera is making an exposure mistake, it's making it based on the tonalities of the scene not the light levels. So even if the light levels change, the exposure mistake and the compensation needed are gonna stay the same. For example, if you're shooting a scene that requires one stop of positive exposure compensation, that will hold true even if the light levels change. So if the sun peeks in and out of the clouds, even though those light levels are changing, the exposure compensation you'll need is gonna remain exactly the same. So once you have the proper exposure compensation adjustment set, you can shoot that same scene all day long and the exposure will be perfect the entire time. On the other hand, in full manual mode, every time the sun goes behind a cloud or comes back out, you have to fiddle with the camera and make an exposure adjustment. Needless to say, there's a lot less work involved in this kind of scenario with exposure compensation. Finally, note that if you use exposure compensation with full manual mode, like when you're setting the shutter speed, the f-stop, and the ISO yourself, it will bias the meter by the amount of compensation you set in, but it will not change the exposure since you have all the control. Again, despite the length of this video, I've really only scratched the surface here, but that should get you started. Remember, if you're a Nikon shooter and you really want to master not just exposure compensation, but every aspect of exposure and metering, grab my ebook, Secrets to Exposure and Metering for Nikon. It's jam packed with hundreds of pages that will make you an expert in every aspect of exposure and metering in no time. Check it out, it'll be a game changer for your photography. Finally, remember to sign up for my free email newsletter to get even more tips, tricks, and advice. Also, check out the BCG Forums page if you want solid, reliable answers to all your photography questions. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe,
and get notified. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.